Our council has been meeting for 30 years, and it's high time we address this topic. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Alison Chris. Hi, it's nice to be here. And just hearing about what all of you do, I'm just so impressed, and you all do such important work. It's just really nice to be here and to meet you all. Um, my name is Dr. Allison Kress, and I specialize in the treatment of cutting and other self-injurious behaviors. Just to give a little background, um, I'm a licensed clinical psychologist, and I did my doctoral dissertation in school on adolescent girls and cutting. Um, and since then, I'm now in private practice in Laguna Niguel in Orange County, and I'd say about 85 to 90 percent of my practice um, are teenagers and adults who are hurting themselves in some way. So I'd like to start off by reading a poem and um, to the best of your ability, really try and feel what this person was saying. It's called Skin Secrets and it was written, written by a 20-year-old female. Okay. My skin tells the story of the pain that I feel. Each scar holds an emotion that I didn't reveal. I beg the world, say, look at me. They do, then I hide. I want no one to see. How will I overcome what I feel within? I no longer want to be afraid, don't want to keep it all in. Yet I can't tell a soul, for they won't understand. My life is controlled by the blade in my hand. But I keep the pain deep inside, never to reveal the secrets that only my skin can tell. And the reason I start with that poem is I really think it captures what a lot of clients that I see um, say in, in therapy. OK, we can go to the next slide. I'm hoping it's going to OK. It's a problem rarely discussed, even though millions struggle with it. And because no one talks about it, many people believe they are suffering alone. And that's a quote by MSNBC.com. And that's something that really I find as well is that People, this is a secret. They, they really feel that um, it's something that they do to express themselves, to cope, and they don't want people to know about it. Um, and so it's, it's something that is a very, it's very prevalent. It's a big problem out there, but it's really, in a lot of cases, below the radar. Okay, so we'll go to presentation overview. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't teach me technology in school, unfortunately. Okay, presentation overview. Cutting and other self-injurious behaviors, what are they? Is cutting a suicide attempt? Prevalence, why people do it? How feelings work? Healthy ways to cope with feelings? How to help someone in need? And a list of resources at the end. Okay. Okay, let me go to the next slide. So let's start talking about what cutting is, um, what self-injury is. Cutting is defined as the intentional cutting of one's skin as a way to cope with what feels like unbearable emotional pain. So basically what it is is a maladaptive way to cope with feelings. Some people, when, you, you know, when people are having problems, they'll go for a run or they'll go watch TV or they'll go talk to a friend. It's the same kind of thing they're trying to cope, they're trying to get through a difficult time, but what they're doing is they're resorting to an unhealthy way of coping. So, you know, there's two different sets. You can cope in an unhealthy way, you can cope in a healthy way. They're going to the unhealthy way. It's just like going to alcohol or drugs or um, things like that. Other terms for self-injury is self-abuse, self-mutilation, self-harm, and self-destructive behavior. So they're all used interchangeably. The ones that you probably see the most is self-injury or self-mutilation or cutting a lot of times is the, is the term people use. Cutting is the most common form of self-injury. Oftentimes people will start with one kind and then progress onto other kinds. So a lot of times what happens is people will start with just using their fingernails and kind of scratching themselves a little bit and then they'll start you know, using paper clips and things that can hurt them but isn't that, um, can't do too much damage. And then they end up progressing on to other things. So um, you name it, but the common things are razor blades and 
um, razor blades, unfortunately, scissors, knives, and then people end up using anything they can find once they get desperate enough. So a lot of times parents will ask me, well, should, you know, at home, should I hide everything? Should I you know, lock the knives in the kitchen? Should I take everything away? And I say, you know what? No, because number one, you're always gonna be able to find something. I've had clients that you know, broke the mirror in their bedroom to get glass or found a bro broken piece of glass on the floor, used shoelaces. People can use anything they want if they get desperate enough. And so what you really want to do is instill in them that you know, they have to be the ones to make a choice in their life and a choice not to do this because it's a choice that they're making. Okay. Next slide, please. Okay. So other forms of self-injury include but are not limited to burning, carving. And what I mean by carving is people tend to carve names or words on their skin. So they'll, they'll actually carve what they're feeling. And you can imagine some of the words that they end up putting on their, most of the time it's their forearm, but other times it's other parts of their body as well. Extracting hair to excess, scratching to excess, biting, interfering with the healing of wounds, chewing the lips, tongue or fingers, and head banging. And as I mentioned before, people are often secretive and ashamed of their behavior, so they cut in places that can't be seen from, uh, by others. So really, forearms, um, I'd say, are the most common. Um, inner thighs are also common. And then uh, sometimes people will actually cut in places that people can see. And we'll talk a little bit later about um, the differentials between that. Sometimes, for the most part, people are secretive about what they're doing, but sometimes people actually hurt themselves and want other people to see as a cry for help. And so those, oftentimes, those people don't hide it. They'll actually make a point to <laughs> cut themselves or hurt themselves and then wear a tank top the next day or things like that. Okay, thank you. 90% of people who self-injure began cutting as teenagers. Without proper treatment, it can often continue into uh, late 20s, 30s, I've seen people as late as 60s. They've been cutting or hurting themselves their whole life. And the good news is, is that this is completely um, treatable and preventable. And people can recover 100% from this. It just oftentimes take, takes getting professional help. Okay, diagnostic criteria. The DSM-4 does not have a distinct diagnosis for self-injury. What I often code this in, in my practice is impulse control disorder, NOS. And that really seems to capture what this is. Um, okay, so in general, experts use similar criteria to diagnose someone as a self-injurer. Um, a therapist in the field uses the following criteria. Okay. Recurrent cutting of one's skin, a sense of tension, present immediately before the act is committed, relaxation, gratification, pleasant feelings, and numbness experience concomitant with the physical pain, a sense of shame and fear of social stigma, causing the individual to attempt to hide scars, blood, or other evidence of the acts of self-harm. And that also captures, I think, what a lot of people feel as they, as they hurt themselves. A lot of times people express feeling a lot of tension and anxiety and angst before, and they use cutting as a way to relieve that tension. And um, oftentimes seeing the blood and, and having a, a ritual to take care of themselves after becomes very common. Okay, the next question, um, there's a lot of myths out there about whether cutting is a suicide attempt or if it's something else. And I get calls all the time from um, therapists and uh, different people, school districts, asking me, okay, what's the difference? Are they trying to kill themselves or what, what's the deal here? Okay, cutting, for the most part, is not a suicide attempt. It's actually the exact opposite in a way. And what I mean by that is, as I mentioned before, when people are hurting themselves, whether it's cutting or burning or some of the other uh, things that I mentioned before, they are trying to cope. They're trying to get through a difficult time so they can keep going. When someone's trying to kill themselves, commit suicide, they're trying to end their life. They're not trying to cope with anything, they're, they're done. 
They, they want to end their life. So really, this is a, a survival tool for many people. I've had several clients who say to me, you know, I, I, I don't want to be doing this to myself, but I'm so afraid that if I stop, that I'm going to become suicidal. So it's a, it's a fine balance. One thing to keep in mind is that people who self-injure can become suicidal, and people who are suicidal can self-injure. But in the moment that the mentality, it's completely two different things. Okay. People, uh, people release, you know, cut or self-injure as a way to release intense emotions that they feel cannot be expressed using words. Okay. Um, some people cut in order to feel the pain because feeling the pain helps them feel alive. So what I mean by that is oftentimes when people are in so much emotional pain, they feel numb. They just don't feel anything and they almost feel dead inside. And so what cutting, the purpose of cutting for them or hurting themselves for them is to feel alive, to, to wake themselves up, get that rush, and actually see blood and remind themselves that, hey, okay, yes, I'm alive, even though I feel really numb. Okay. The prevalence, are we at prevalence? Thank you. It's, it's considered by experts to be a silent and growing epidemic. Experts assert that cutting is quickly replacing anorexia as the most critical mental health problem currently facing adolescent girls. Self-injury is where eating disorders were 20 years ago. Okay. It's estimated that approximately 1% of the population engages in self-injury, 10% and that means one out of 10 teenagers engage in self-injury, and that's both urban and rural. 12% in college populations, one in eight, and females are more likely to self-harm than males. That's a two to one ratio. Okay, the reason why, uh, in my belief, um, that, a lot, that more females self-injure than males, I've had this question several times from people, and my belief is that I think that females, in general, are socialized to internalize their emotions. So, um, you know, if, if someone hurts their feelings or something bad happens to them, females, for the most part, are socialized to keep it in, not rock the boat, pretend everything's okay, keep a smile on their face. In contrast, men are socialized more so to, you know, deal with the problem as it comes, and, um, and talk to the person. So really what ends up happening is when, and, and I'm talking in general terms, but when males get angry, they'll act out. So if they're real angry and let's say not coping effectively, they might go punch something, they might go punch someone, <laughs> they might go you know, drive their car real fast or do something outward. With females, oftentimes what happens is they'll internalize their pain and keep it inside and they end up having to act out how they're feeling, act out um, by taking it out on themselves. Okay. The greatest predictors for adolescents, low self-esteem, anxiety, depression, social isolation, alienation from peer group, and abuse. It's estimated that approximately 50% of people who are self-injuring have been abused, and I think that's a conservative estimate. I'm going to read a few different quotes from people who are self-injuring. This is a female age 17, and she's been hurting herself for seven years, and she's a high school senior. I am full of anger and hurt. I feel like nobody cares. I do it because it is easier for me to hurt myself and deal with the pain than it is to tell someone and hurt their feelings. I would rather be the one hurting. I never want to make someone feel the way people make me feel so I don't say anything. I keep everything to myself and then it builds up. I explode and then I start cutting. This is a female age 16. She's been self-injuring for four years and she's a high school junior taking college classes. I do it because I can't get mad at people, at least on the surface. Anytime someone acts mean to me or anything, I just get sad. But it all wells up and then all of a sudden, the next time I get yelled at, get sad, I just sort of snap. 
Then I run upstairs as fast as I can and cut until everything goes away. I used to be different, though. I used to just experiment, cut, poke, burn, etc. Now I can't stop myself when I need to do it, but I also can't make myself do it when I don't need to. This is a female, age 15. She's been hurting herself for one year. I get depressed. I don't know why. If anything goes wrong at school or at home, if I forget my homework and a teacher shouts at me, if someone doesn't ring me when they said they would, silly stuff, really. But after I self-injure, I feel disgusted at myself. I feel as if nobody, no matter how hard I try, I can't do anything right. I first cut when I was 14 after being raped by my geography teacher. And the last one here is, this is a female, age 16, and she's been hurting herself for 10 years. She's a high school sophomore. I hate myself. I would rather have pain on the outside that I can understand than the pain on the inside that's impossible to even conceive. I just don't want people to read what I've put and, I, and realize that they don't want to end up like me. I'm only 16, and I've been doing this for more than half my life, and I don't think I'll ever stop. Something that she said, um, she'd ha rather have the pain on the outside, something that she can see in a concrete way, rather than trying to understand what's, what's going on inside. I hear that a lot in my practice, a, a lot from uh, especially um, teenage girls um, and adults, but I'd say more with, with, with teenagers, that they just, they, they know they have all these strong emotions inside, they know they have all this pain, but they can't make sense of it. They're, it's just all feels jumbled up to them and they can't really think it through, but they just know they're hurting. And so when they hurt themselves, when they cut themselves, they can actually see their pain, and it makes so much more sense to them. And it gives them a reason to say, okay, I'm hurting, this, this is why I'm hurting. <laughs> and it's, it's showing them um, that they're in pain. Okay. Okay, people self-injure because they are in pain, and they're trying to cope, as I mentioned. One of the most common reasons for self-injury is to get relief from intense emotions. Often people who self-injure cannot adequately express their emotions using words. And people use self-injury as their form of communication. And so what I mean by that is oftentimes people, as I mentioned, have, so, have these very strong emotions inside, but they can't find the words to express themselves. And so, you know, whether that means that they lived in a home that was abusive, where it was dangerous to express themselves. So a lot of times, um, some of the clients I've worked with came from alcoholic homes, and it was, wasn't safe for them to express themselves. So if they felt angry at one of their parents, or um, even had a bad day at school, or something was going wrong, it was dangerous for them, um, or they were scared to express themselves in their home. And so what they would do is just keep it all inside and eventually that builds up. Um, let's see. Other times, people use, use self-injury um, as a way to communicate, as I said, their feelings um, about someone else or about how they're feeling inside. Sometimes people, teenagers especially, will self-injure because they said that their friend did it and they want their friend to stop. And so they told their friend that if they don't stop, then they're gonna, if they cut themselves, then they're gonna cut themselves kind of as a, as a warning or a threat. And that doesn't work very well either. <laughs> a lot of times what I do in therapy, and this is something that if you are working with someone, is it's important to help someone find the words. For, so really what, what self-injury is, is they're, and I explain this to them, the parents, they're acting out how they're feeling. Instead of using words, they're, they're showing people, they're showing themselves how they're feeling. So what you want to do is help people find the words to express themselves. So a lot of times I say, and um, it, you know, I'll say, if you could put words to your actions, or if you could put words even to the blood, what would what would you be saying? And that's something a lot of times they haven't thought about before. Okay. Physical pain becomes a coping strategy or a distraction for masking emotional pain that is perceived by the ind individual as beyond their control. This is a quote from a client's poetry. How will you know I'm hurting if you cannot see my pain? To wear it on my body tells what words cannot explain. Often people self-injure because they are either feeling too much or they are not feeling enough. 
Cutting serves as a way to regulate their emotions and bring themselves back to a neutral status. So what I mean by that is really there's usually two different reasons for why people hurt themselves, and they're on the extreme sides. Either they're completely numb, as I mentioned before, they don't feel anything, um, and they're trying to feel alive, or that they're feeling so anxious and so full of tension that they need a way to release, release that tension and, and, and um, bring themselves back down. So it's almost as used like, like a drug. And um, let's see. OK. So for example, people who are feeling too much may feel overwhelmed by anxiety, sadness, disappointment, anger, self-hatred, or rejection. And cutting serves as their soothing agent and releases mounting tension. People who aren't feeling enough, they feel numb and dead inside. Um, cutting acts similar to taking a stimulant. It helps them pr the person feel alive, energetic, and full of life. For some, self-injury is used as a way to gain control over a situation, past or present, in which there was a perceived lack of control. And this really, I think, uh, pertains especially to abuse, in that people will self-injure for several reasons. Um, in, in abusive situations, one of the reasons people self-injure, and it could be abuse from the past or even now, but it's a way for them to gain control over their body and over a situation w in which they felt that they had no control. And so let's say with you know, physical or sexual abuse, they felt out of control. Someone else was controlling them. They didn't feel like they could um, make decisions about what was happening. And so when they can finally are alone, when they, when they um, feel like they can take back that control, They'll end up doing things to themselves. It's their body, and it's, it's, it's a way for them to control the situation and, and kind of gain that back. Even though, again, it's an unhealthy way to do it, that's oftentimes what people do. For others, self-injury is used as a way to self-punish, for self-punishment. So that can mean, for many things, meaning people that get bad grades in school, or they feel like they can't do anything right, um, it, it's, it can be used for um, a number of different reasons, but just like many of us, if we make a mistake, you know, we will go say, "Oh, I can't believe I did that," or make a joke, or make it better. <laughs> but with people that are self-injuring, it's it's a way to to punish themselves. And oftentimes, people who do self-injure are perfectionistic. I found um, they really expect a lot from themselves, and when they make a mistake, and this could be a little mistake, even a mistake that most people wouldn't even consider a mistake. They think that, oh, I need to punish myself. I, I, I made a mistake. I didn't do something right. And um, unfortunately, that's what happens. OK, here's a personal story of a 15-year-old girl. It's really like an addiction. You do it the first time, and you see how much better you feel. Then when you feel bad again, you think, hey, that cutting thing helped. So you start doing it every time you feel bad. I did it when I was afraid my friends didn't like me anymore. I did it when I was worried. I did it if I got a bad grade. I did it even if I had cavities. As soon as I, ha as soon as I began to feel bad about something, the thought just popped into my head and I had to cut. I just kept thinking that the sooner I cut, the sooner the bad feelings would go away. So why wait? I realized I didn't have to feel, I didn't have to suffer because I could cut. And what, ha what oftentimes what happens is people, someone will start hurting themselves and they'll kind of try it out and experiment with it and then realize, like, wait a minute, this, this is kind of working. And so they'll keep doing it and it ends up, it ends up being their, their coping strategy. So just like, again, you know, people that are mentally healthy, they'll go cope like I said, going for a run or talking to friends or watching TV or doing something like that, people who are self-injuring ends up being their go-to. So they feel like they made a mistake. They got a bad grade. They got in a fight with friends. They disappointed somebody. They feel stressed in their marriage. It could be a number of different things. It could be little, little things, but that, that's how they end up coping with life. Another thing to keep in mind, too, when I say they realize that cutting worked, it actually does work which is unfortunate. And the reason I say that is, when somebody hurts themselves, our bodies are wired so that when we 
um, hurt ourselves, let's say we get in a car accident or, or fall down, really hurt yourself, your body's wired so it releases endorphins, which is the, those feel-good hormones. It releases the endorphins and makes you feel really good and calm. So just like you, know, you can get endorphins from working out, this also releases endorphins. Um, but it's an unhealthy way to get there. So it actually does work, and it, it, it makes the person feel better. Okay, so again, correlation with trauma. Cutting is highly correlated with trauma, namely experiencing sexual, physical, or emotional abuse or neglect as a child. And again, I'd say about 50% of people who are self-injuring have had some type of trauma in their past, and I do think that's a conservative estimate. I think it's a lot higher than that. Cutting serves many purposes for the abused or traumatized individual. It can provide a way to reenact the former abuse as an attempt to reclaim a sense of control and autonomy. It can provide a way to punish oneself, a way to rele relieve tension, or it can be used as a method to express overwhelming feelings that they believe no words could possibly express. So again, going back to what we were talking about before, sometimes people will self-injure as a way to reenact a former abuse, but this time they're in control. And another t uh, other times people will, will self-injure as a way to um, identify with, with the abuser. Sometimes, as you know, I'm sure you know, people that are abused will actually identify with with their abuser as a way to connect with them, maybe make it seem to, in their mind like it's not as bad as it really is. And so um, a lot of times people will end up hurting themselves as a way to kind of keep that bond going with that person, even though that's such an unhealthy way to go about <laughs> um, dealing with something like that, dealing with a situation like that. They'll actually do that as a way to connect with that person. Okay. And then again, cutting is a pain they can't control. I have a few other uh, quotes from people. Okay, this is female, age 16. She's been hurting herself for two years. She's a high school junior on um, high school junior honors track. I'm not physically abused, but I get any self-esteem or self-worth I might have, God forbid, developed ripped, developed ripped to shreds by my parents on a regular basis. There's sort of an internal pressure, like I can only keep the mask on for so long, be obedient and meek and perfect for so long before I think I'll explode. This is female, age 18, and she's been hurting herself for two years since she's in college. I do it to stop thinking. The blood, the cutting, gives me something else to look at and concentrate on. If I stop, then the feelings I'm trying to block out come back. If I do it for long enough, then when I'm done, that is what I can think about. Or the time has passed until I can do something else. In our household, we have to be brave. Crying is not allowed. My father has a very short temper, and if you make noise that will annoy him like crying, he gets mad. I'm not incapable of crying, I just can't. For my sake, it's best that I don't. I do it to stop thinking so I have something else to occupy my mind in times of pain. I cry through the blood. My body cries for me. This is a female, age 17. She's been hurting herself for seven years. She's a high school senior. I am full of anger and hurt. I feel like nobody cares. I do it because it is easier for me to hurt myself. Did I read this one already? Did I already read this one? Does this sound familiar? No. I would rather be the one hurting. I never want to make someone feel the way people make me feel. OK, I have another one. OK. Reasons differ, but usually it's to deal with emotional pain. I do it because it makes me forget about everything else. Before, I feel lost, depressed, and overwhelmed. During, I forget about everything and concentrate on the task at hand. Afterwards, I feel like a total failure, a freak, an outcast. And she's 15 with a 3.9 GPA. This is a female, age 15. And she's been hurting herself for one year. Enraged, sad, lonely, stupid, worthless, irrational, crazy. I can't stand what I think because I sound like such a whiner, so self-involved. During, I feel very focused and full of anticipation. 
I purposely hold my breath as I cut and let it out when I'm through, so I breathe out as the blood runs out. I feel so calm. All the noise and stu stupidity in my head is gone. I feel like I'm floating. I feel stupid because I feel like I don't have a reason to do it. That's why I keep it to myself. It's a female, age 18, high school senior. It is pretty much the only way I can release what I'm feeling. Either I'm really angry or sad and numb. Before, I feel really disconnected from myself and hurt. During, it's kind of like I'm in control of whatever, even though I'm telling myself it's dumb to do this. After, I feel ashamed, but I also kind of feel relieved, really relieved. And that's something that I find a lot of times is there's, there's really a, a ritual that go, goes along with this for a lot of people in that, and this kind of talks, sums up a lot of what, what people have been saying in here, which is a lot of times people will want to concentrate on something else. They don't feel like they can express themselves using their words. And so by hurting themselves, it really takes their mind off whatever's bothering them. And so it becomes a ritual for them. And so they'll ha a lot of times people have little cutting kits, um, especially the, I find parents end up finding those a lot. And in their cutting kits, they'll have you know, whatever implement they decide to use to hurt themselves, plus um, Band-Aids and bandages and white, uh, alcohol wipes, and a whole kit to um, you know, hurt themselves and then take care of themselves after. And a lot of the time, that becomes something that is important to the person, which is they hurt themselves, and especially for abused people, they get to take care of themselves afterwards. And so they feel hurt, they have this pain, and then they get to nurture themselves and love themselves and take care of themselves. And that becomes very significant for them. And oftentimes I find that that's the reason as their wounds are healing, they'll start picking at their scabs and, and kind of re-injuring themselves so that they can go through the ritual again of caring for themselves and taking care of themselves, which is something that they you know, didn't feel they could do before. Go to the next slide, please. Okay, so let's talk about what's normal behavior and what's self-injurious behavior. Um, due to the rise in marking one's skin in t today's culture, such as through body piercing and tattooing, it's important to recognize the difference between what's self-injury and what's not. So what I like to tell people is that if they are hurt, if they are getting tattoos or getting piercings or doing things as a form of self-expression <laughs> on their bodies, but getting relief from it. If they get really excited before and, and feel an emotional relief from it when they get it done, then that is considered self-injury, in my mind. People have different, you know, people in the field have different opinions um, on this, but in my mind, if you're gonna be doing something um, where someone's going to be hurting you and you're looking forward to it, you kind of get that same, you know, tension and anxiety before and get that relief during, that in my mind is self-injury. So I always tell my patients, um, a lot of times they'll even ask, well, I'm really into, I really like tattoos, I really like piercings, do you think it's okay? And I say, definitely not right now. You know, when, you, when you're better and some time has passed, then that'll be a decision for you to make, but right now I see it as the same thing. And so, um, at the same time, it's important to keep in mind that it is, for some people, this normal um, expression. So they'll express themselves and express their identity by piercings and tattoos. So really the question is, are you doing this to get relief? Are you doing this, you get something, a secondary gain from this? Or is it just that you want this on your body as a way to express yourself? Okay. Thank you. There's two women in the field, um, I actually worked closely with them when I did my dissertation in school. And they have, they started the first inpatient program in Chicago, it's called Safe Alternatives. And they have a book out there called, it's called Bodily Harm. I actually um, highly recommend it if you, if you would like a book on this. Bodily Harm by Karen Conterio and Wendy Later. And they recommend, this is in their book, um, the utilization of four questions um, to ask people to decipher whether this is self-injurious behavior or not. The first is, do you feel compulsively drawn to engage in the behavior? Second is, do you get a high from the way the activity feels physically, or are you just trying to make an artistic statement with your body? 
Three, does the behavior consume your thoughts or interfere with your ability to function normally? Four, realistically, could you stop the behavior today if you wanted to? So I think those are, those are good criteria to go by. Okay, here's some personal consequences that people have expressed. This is a female, age 18, and she's a high school graduate. I think the worst negative consequence of my self-injuring was that I wasted four years of my life. For four years, cutting was what my whole life was about. Everything revolved around cutting. And as cutting was my thing, essentially I became a very self-absorbed self -absorbed person. I never stopped to think about how my actions might be affecting other people. Everything was about me and my cutting. And that's something I think is important to point out if you are working with someone who's hurting themselves is they don't realize that they think, you know, I'm not feeling well, I'm just doing, I hear this all the time, what's the big deal, it's, it's my body, I can do what I want with it, I'm not going to kill myself, it's, it's not that deep, what's the big deal? And what they don't realize and what we talk about is, first of all, you know, it's, it is a big deal that they're hurting themselves, and second, they don't realize that they're hurting the people that, they, that care about them and that love them and that they love too. And they don't realize that. They don't think about that for the most part. This is a male, age 24, high school graduate. Part of the reason I self-injure is because I lead a double life. I am gay, and most of my family and friends do not know, so the stress leads me to self-injure. The only problem was, then I had the stress of trying to keep the self-injuring a secret too. Like they say, a vicious circle. And that's another thing I think that's very important to point out when you are working with someone who is hurting themselves is that the reason that they're, hurt, the reason that they're drawn to doing this in the first place is to cope. They have, they have a problem <laughs> and they're already not feeling well. So by doing this, essentially what they're doing is they're creating two problems rather than one. So maybe you know, for a little bit, it might make them feel better. Okay, I get that. But afterwards, they're left with not only the problem that they started with, but now they're left with the problem that they just did this to themselves. They just hurt themselves. So now they have two problems. And oftentimes it also leads to them knowing that they hurt themselves, but then also all the stress of trying to hide it from other people, and then the stress of you know, a lot of the, the teenagers that I see that were hurting themselves before summer. Oh, now I can't wear you know, my shorts. I can't wear my tank tops. And actually, with teenage girls, I found that's very, um, important to, to mention to them, it, it, it works. You know, I, you know, I'll say, do you realize that if you hurt yourself, you know, I think it was March, April, May, that you're not gonna be able to wear summer clothes with, without people noticing that you've been hurting yourself. And it works. I mean, teenagers, you know, <laughs> their outfits and their clothes and all that, it's very important to them and what their friends think. So I've found that that really hits home for them. This is a female, age 24, and she has her bachelor's. I'm so embarrassed about the scars on my forearms. I can't wear t-shirts now without having to face the fact that I did that to my arms. Sometimes I feel as though that's what people focus on when they first meet me. And the last one is female, age 29, and she's a university student. I'm back in school. I work full time. I have a 4.0. I'm considered to be very together very in control, very gifted. If I told people about this problem, most would not believe me, so I don't feel like anybody ever really knows me, and then I begin to feel like I'm not real. Okay, so let's go on to warning signs. And like I mentioned before, for the most part, people are very secretive about this behavior. They don't want anybody to know about it. It's, it's their secret, and they're very good at hiding it and they're very good liars. They get good at it. So one of the most common excuses out there is the cat did this to me. Because a lot of times that's what it looks like, especially with superficial cuts. It does look like it could be the cat. Uh, I had somebody else say that they were climbing a fence and scratched themselves and they were going over the fence. I've heard, I've heard all kinds of excuses. But I'd say for the most part, the, old, the cat scratched me is, <laughs> is very common. OK, so warning signs can include but not, not limited to, unexplained frequent injury, including cuts and burns, wearing loves, long sleeves and pants in warm weather, low self-esteem, difficulty handling feelings, relationship problems, poor functioning at work, school, or home, a history of emotional problems, 
abuse, drug alcohol abuse, anxiety, and impulsive behavior. Wearing long sleeves and pants, that I see that all the time. I mean, it could be during the heat wave a couple of weeks ago, I had clients coming in in you know, heavy sweatshirts and long pants, and it was 97 out. So th that's very common. A lot of times, too, what they'll do is they'll make a hole in their sweatshirt or their long, and their long sleeve shirts, so their thumb will go through it, so their, so their um, sleeves won't come up. Keeps it down. OK. So let's talk about briefly how feelings work. And I go over this a lot with clients. Um, it's pretty simple, but unless someone tells you about it, it's kind of hard to put it together in your mind, or you just don't think about it. OK, so this is the healthy way to cope with feelings. When you experience a hurt, which is pain in the present, you want to tell the person who hurt you that he hurt you when he hurt you. So basically what that's saying is when something happens, you want to deal with it in the moment, deal with the problem, get it out, and resolve it. If you don't, it stays inside and it leads to feelings of anger. Anger is pain in the past. So anger comes from holding on to a hurt and remembering being hurt. Anger leads to guilt. And all guilt is is when you direct your anger inside and fe feel devalued by your own hatred. If you keep holding on to this, if you don't deal with what's bothering you, it leads to depression and anxiety. And depression is the energy consumed by withholding anger. You feel drained, discouraged, and despairing. And anxiety is pain in the future. The expectation of injury, you feel like something bad is about to happen. So basically, in a nutshell, what this is saying is when something happens, you want to deal with it in the moment. You want to deal with your feelings and not hold it in. And um, an analogy that I often use with my clients is you can think of your, your body as like a, a, a volcano. And so what happens is as, as life happens, as, as there's problems, as there's hurts, as there's uh, disappointments and pain in your life, if you don't handle the problem as it comes, you end up creating this pressure inside and layer after layer after layer. So yeah, for a while, you can, you can deal with what's going on inside. You can deal with that pain. It's not too much. But as life keeps happening, if, as pain keeps happening and disappointment and um, things that make you upset happen in life, which happens to everybody, it's part of life, it's, it keeps building up. And this pressure builds up. And eventually, people can only take so much. We're all only human. Eventually, it's going to come out some way to deal with it. You can't hold it all in forever. And that's where. Cutting and self-injury comes in. That's where drugs and alcohol comes in. That's where a lot of um, compulsive behaviors come in, which is people can't have too much that they're holding in. They're trying to deal with the pain they have inside. And by the time people come in to see me, a lot of times they have no idea what's bothering them. And I believe them. It's because there's a lot of times it's not just one thing that, they, that's, that happened. It's not one incident. It's all these smaller incidents that just kept building up and building up and building up to the point that they exploded and it had to come out. And so a lot of times what I'll do with them is eventually we'll work on the underlying pain. What, what is all this? <laughs> and, um, and talk about it and find words to express and resolve and deal with those problems that they hadn't dealt with when it happened. So the nut nutshell of this is deal with pain as it happens. Don't hold it inside because that leads to anger, guilt, depression, and anxiety. Treatment. People seek treatment because they are in emotional pain, and the goal is to help them identify what they are, feel what they are feeling, where it is coming from, and how to resolve it. Okay. This is something that I work on in practice, in private practice, with my clients. What you uh, want to do is, as I mentioned before, cutting is an unhealthy coping strategy. So what we want to do is help them find healthy ways to cope with their feelings. And a lot of times what they'll say is, oh, but it's not going to do the same thing. It's, and I, I agree, you know, and I say, you're right. It's not gonna, you're not going to get the same effect from this. But you're also going to be dealing with this in a healthy way and not having two problems at the end rather than one. And people don't feel good about what they're doing. Even if someone comes in saying, I like what I'm doing. I don't want to stop. You can't make me stop. There's, I have never met one, I haven't met someone yet <laughs> that 
has come in and they haven't had at least a small part of them inside that hates what they're doing. They just feel trapped and stuck and don't know what else to do. But there, I have never met someone that once you start talking to them, there's always, there's always a part of them that, that wants to stop and hates that they're doing this. And so the trick is to really find that part and build that up. So some of the alternative coping strategies I've come up with with people is writing in a journal, listening to music, deep breathing exercises or progressive muscle relaxation, challenging distorted thinking, ask for help, talking and listening to a trusted person, take a shower or bath, as long as that's safe for them, <laughs> uh, take a walk, make a collage, write a letter to the person or problem, and plan regular activities for the most difficult part of the day. One of the things here, challenging distorted thinking, a lot of times people that are self-injuring really have um, black and white thinking. It's all or none for them. It's, it's either things are good or things are bad, or they'll, they'll go through a situation and they see it as, oh, I did this, they must hate me. <laughs> they, don't see the, they don't see the middle ground. Um, and a lot of times you know, when people are depressed, I explain to them that when you're depressed, it's almost like you have a magnet on you and you automatically, all the things that, the negative things <laughs> that are out there, you, that's, that's all you see. You have that magnet because of your feelings of depression. You see just the negative, but, but what you want to do is help them find that the other part, the, the positive part, the magnet that has the, the positive side and help them see that there's, wait a minute, all you're seeing is the stuff on the very extreme side, all the negative, but there's all this gray area and all this great stuff out here too. You're just not seeing it yet. And so we really want to challenge their distorted thinking. Okay. Prognosis. The good news is that self-injury is treatable and 100% recovery is possible. Cutting is a behavior and behaviors can be changed. And I say that over and over and over again to people. This is a behavior. This is not who you are. This is not your identity. This doesn't define you. This is a behavior that you're doing and you can change it. It's a choice and you're make, it's a, you can make the choice not to do this even though it doesn't feel like a choice. Oftentimes people will say, I don't even know what happens. I just, all of a sudden I get this, you know, this rush and I end up hurting myself and I don't even realize what I'm doing until after. And so you want to really help them um, realize that this is a behavior and if they pay attention and get professional help to learn how um, to, to pay attention and notice the warning signs and, and do things like that, that they don't have to be doing this. The most salient factors when assessing prognosis are the person's motivation and determination to change. It's the number one reason. If they want to stop, they can stop. If they don't, you can give them all the tools and resources that, <laughs> that, that, that that's out there and they, they won't. It, they, they need to be wanting to, to stop. And if they're not, then meet them where they are, find that small glimmer of hope and, and the part in them that doesn't want to be doing this anymore and build that up. Okay, preventative strategies, express yourself, like what we've been saying all along. You really want to express yourself, find words, find words to express yourself rather than acting out. And preventative strategies, realistic self-talk, this is the last slide. This is some things that I just go over with people. Um, be honest and true to myself. It is okay to let myself be distressed for a little while. I am not helpless. I can and will take the steps needed to get through this crisis. One step at a time. I know I will be okay no matter what happens. In the long run, who will remember or care? I like that one. Other people's opinions of me are just their opinions. My past does not control my future. I like that one a lot too. I am willing to do whatever is necessary to make tomorrow better. And that's it, I'd be happy to answer any questions out there or comments? Sure. In my practice, 11. And I'm finding it's getting younger and younger. Yeah. I was just wondering, it seems like you've shared with a lot of like talking types of things. Yeah. Do you have any types of work that you've done? Do you have any other types of like art therapy or things that are very handy to do? Oh, yeah. There's, there's plenty. This is, this is just, yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, one is you obviously want to go where the, where the person's interests lie. So for some people, drawing, I found, 
is a wonderful way to express themselves. Even finger painting, um, because especially people that are injuring themselves, they feel the need to do something with their hands because they're so used to do, acting out and doing something. So to, to it really helps to find, find something else for them to do that they can use their hands with. So finger painting I really like, drawing. Um, there's uh, something called an impulse control log that's actually in the bodily harm book that helps someone. A lot of times what happens is people will kind of, like I said, uh, space out, if you, if you will, and not realize what they're doing, they'll hurt themselves, and then after they realize, well, the impulse control log helps them think it through first. So they'll get the urge, then they have to fill out this log to really help identify what they're thinking, what they're feeling, and create this space so they can think it through and make a, a healthy choice. That's another thing. Yes? Yes. Yes, um, I'd say ADD, depression, um, bipolar disorder. Those are some of the, the diagnoses that I see a lot. Mm -hmm. Yes. Depends on the person. Sometimes there's an older sibling. Sometimes they learn this from peers at school. And then you know, if you, if you if you keep your eyes open, it's not too hard to see to find in the media. I mean, Seventeen magazine, all the teenage magazines, they have articles, um, movies. There's plenty of movies out there. Uh, it, it's it's something that most kids know about or have heard about before. And oftentimes that's how it starts. They they're curious and want to see what's going on. What I found though is a lot of times kids will experiment with this. But, and then they'll be over it. They'll say, oh, this isn't, I don't want to be doing this. But the ones that keep doing it, those are the ones that there's more to it than just experimenting. There's an underlying problem going on that you want to address. Oh, yeah, it's, it's very important. You know, kids don't grow up in a vacuum. <laughs> um, it, it, a lot of times, uh, I'd say the majority of the time, there are family dynamics that's at least contributing to what they're doing. may not be the primary cause, oftentimes it is the primary cause, but usually there's family dynamics that's contributing to their behavior, and it's very important to involve the family. So would that be a choice the child would make, or do you just, that's your format, that you make sure that the family comes in at a certain stage? Yes. Um, Depending on the situation, either in my practice, either what I'll do is, if it does seem like there's a lot of family issues going on, is I'll see the person who's injuring, and then another therapist in the office, it's a group practice, will see the parents. So we'll do that, and then we'll have joint sessions as needed. Or if there's just things going on, if family dynamics that's, that's contributing, um, but maybe the, fam the parents don't need to be seen separate, is I'll work with the, the teenager or the child, and then as things come up, as they start saying, oh, I hate when my parents do this, it makes me crazy, and that's when I start getting really anxious or depressed, then I'll say, okay, well, this sounds like something that we need to talk to your parents about, and we'll find a way to, find a way that they feel comfortable expressing that, and we'll practice, and they'll bring their parents in, and go from there, yeah. Sure. Uh, how do you address that if they live in a home with domestic violence? the pressure is from a violent home because that would in turn probably put the child more in danger. Right, and that's, that's... So what would be your suggested... Very good question. Is, is that are you? So I can't bring often the parents. Right, and I've had situations like that too. And bottom line is, is the kid's safety. I and mean, that has to come first. And so that's where, in those situations where I work from, you know, what's in their best interest and how, how do we keep them safe. So if it's not safe for them to express themselves to the other members, then definitely don't. So maybe it means them writing letters or drawing in, their, in sessions and then we'll shred it yeah. <laughs> after or I'll keep it for them or um, finding another trusted person to talk to, things like that. But yeah, safety has to come first. I noticed is on a lot of the coach that the children were doing very well at school and had very high expectations 
But then he said one of the predictors and one of the warning signs was poor grades. And it seemed to be the opposite. Right. It can be either or. A lot of times people that are self-injuring are perfectionistic and they will, they would never guess. You would never guess some of the people that come to my office, you think that they have everything going for them and they do. You know, great grades and sports and extracurricular activities and all that stuff. Um, so they project this perfect image on the outside, but they end up internalizing everything because they always want to seem perfect, but then they all the pain and emotion, they end up taking it out of themselves so they don't um, hurt anybody else and rock the boat. But then the other side is um, kids that are depressed, that are um, not, they're not getting good grades, they're full of anxiety, low felt self-esteem, and have a hard time socializing, peers, things like that. That's the other side of the spectrum. Because, because of the time, because of the time, we need to cut the, the formal questions here. If anybody has more questions, do you mind, Allison? Okay. So we'll have more questions afterwards, sort of privately, but I know people have to get out and get to work. So um, thank you so much for giving such a clear presentation. children that came from very bad backgrounds such as you were talking about and she wanted to know why some kids made it and some didn't her study found that they all the one thing they all had in common was one adult outside the family that stuck with them through thick and thin who made who um, allowed them to make mistakes and, and helped them to understand you're not a mistake because you made one and you can do it. So if we can all just try to make that connection, even with the child that can't go home and talk, if we can be that person in a child's life, they have a better chance of making it than uh, if they have nobody to talk to. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you, everybody, for being here.